In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Professor Terry Hughes from John Cook University in Australia about the rapidly changing coral reefs. We discuss the changing state of the global oceans and the degraded condition of the Great Barrier Reef ahead of this austral summer bleaching event. Thank you for listening and supporting Climate Gen. In the next episode, I'm speaking with ecologist Mike Hans about his incredible regenerative agroforestry project that has the potential to end slash and burn farming whilst transforming resilience in the tropics. I also speak to Professor Kevin Anderson about where we go next given the overt failing position of the British government on climate. As policymakers meet in Dubai for the pre-COP discussions, it is with great sadness that we note the death of Professor Salim al Haq on the 28th of October. Salim has been a huge source of insight for my work over the last decade, giving me many interviews that provide the much-needed perspective of the vulnerable nations in the Global South. As mentioned before, my own book, Cop Out, is available for pre-order, and I'm pleased to say that Salim's wise words inform the narrative, threading the way from Paris to this year's COP in the UAE. Thank you to all YouTube and Patreon subscribers for supporting the channel. With ever more aspects of the climate and ecological crisis emerging, your support makes a difference. Terry, thank you very much for speaking to me today. It's great to meet you. Can we just start with a a sort of very broad brush overview of the role of the corals in the ecology of the oceans? Corals are the architecture of coral reefs. They create the habitat. Uh, So just like you can't have a rainforest without rainforest trees or a a kelp bed without kelp plants, they're a so-called keystone or architectural species. They provide the nooks and crannies for all the other critters that make up the iconic biodiversity of of coral reefs that they're famous for. So when you lose a lot of corals through a bleaching event due to climate change, for example, it has a very broad impact on all the other creatures that live in association with the corals. It's not just the corals that are lost. It's the it's the whole integrity of the ecosystem. You lose a lot of fish and so on. Can you just talk briefly about the, the connection between what we're seeing with these sort of ocean heat waves now and heating of the oceans and how that impacts the corals? So corals are quite heat sensitive. When corals respond to severe heat stress, to record-breaking summer temperatures, They do so quite spectacularly. They become very colourful initially as they try and defend themselves from the heat stress, and then they lose their colour and become stark white, the phenomena of coral bleaching. So it's quite spectacular. Um, You can see it from an airplane, and obviously underwater, it's quite confronting and, and stunning in a way. So it's very visible. So I think coral reefs are the iconic poster child, if you like, of climate change impacts on ecosystems, especially marine ecosystems, but they're certainly not unique in terms of the responses that all are already happening due to the level of global warming that we've already seen in, in recent decades. Okay, and you just sort of say, talking about out of sight, out of mind, but insight, you've got the Great Barrier Reef, which is obviously an area you're extremely familiar with. Can you talk about what you see as the outlook for this summer, where you've got this sort of El Nino combined with the anthropogenic climate change, which climate heating is probably a better description. Yeah, there's a lot in that question. Let me try and unpack it. In most tropical oceans, sea temperatures are a little bit higher during El Nino conditions. And obviously, we've had El Ninos forever. Um, Since the last ice age, we've had many hundreds, if not thousands of them on an irregular cycle. They return on average about every five years. The other part of the Enso cycle, La Nina, is slightly cooler in most parts of the tropical ocean. There are some exceptions. For many, many years, El Ninos were not a problem for coral reefs. They only became a problem in the early 1980s through to the 1990s as the background temperature increased year on year due to global warming. So the first regional scale bleaching of corals 
was in the strong El Nino year of 82-83, and that affected places like the Eastern Pacific. The first time we recognize a global coral bleaching event was in the very strong El Nino of 97-98. That was the first time that the Great Barrier Reef bleached. And if it had bleached in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or the rest of the 1990s up to 1998, we'd have known about it because of tourism and the science was already quite well developed in that period. So the first record on the Barrier Reef of a severe bleaching event was in 1998. It happened again in 2002. And then we were very lucky to have a 14-year gap before the third event in 2016, and unlucky to have a, only a, a one-year gap in 2017. So that was the first example of back-to-back -back coral bleaching in two consecutive years which is something that the climate modelers tell us will be routine in a few decades from now, depending on the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. We saw further events in 2020 and 2022. And to answer your question, we are almost certain to see what will be the seventh mass coral bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef next summer. Our summers, <clears throat> our summers of course, are six months um, uh, out of phase with the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and, and as many of your listeners may be aware, that Northern Hemisphere coral reefs have copped a beating this Northern Hemisphere summer, particularly Florida, Cuba, but also Mexico, Belize. And now there are warnings for places like Jamaica and the Cayman Islands and Trinidad. So we're, we're seeing the tail end now of a summer bleaching event that has impacted most of the Caribbean basin. And they've seen record temperatures. The bleaching began unusually early, so it lasted long. It was a long, hot summer that's now coming towards the end in most parts of the Caribbean. Summer temperatures peak in end of August through September. Whereas in Australia, on the Great Barrier Reef, peak summer temperatures generally peak in March, late February to March, depending on the intensity of the heat wave and what's happening in a, in a particular summer. So we're still about five months away from when we could expect to see a major bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. We're still in the very early phases of an El Nino cycle. In fact, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology hasn't yet called it as an El Nino event. They still think there's about a 30% chance that El Nino won't develop. But regardless, it's already shaping up to be the hottest year on record for the whole planet. So yes, we are very concerned about the likelihood of bleaching on the Great Barrier this coming summer. You talked a moment ago about the sort of bigger gaps you had between 1990s up to the early decades of this century and now you're getting into yep. back back to back bleaching events what's the resilience or irreversibility because obviously now we're more likely to see more back to backs it seems to be the trend so those gaps are really important ecologically they're the window of opportunity for recovery of the parts of the great barrier reef that have been impacted typically in each of the bleaching events that we've seen so far, about a third of the Great Barrier Reef is severely bleached each time. The footprint varies from one event to the next, depending on where the heat was in, in a particular summer. So in 2016, for example, the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef was very severely damaged. In 2017 and 2022, it was the central region. In 2020, it was the southern region. So if you look at the geography of each of those bleaching events and superimpose them to look at the cumulative impact, about 80% of the Great Barrier Reef now has severely bleached at least once since 2016. So that doesn't give them a lot of time for recovery. And particularly for slow growing, long lived corals, if a 50 year old coral dies, from heat stress and bleaching, it takes at least 50 years for another individual of that age to replace it. So instead, what we're seeing is during these quite short gaps now, recovery of the faster growing species, we call them weedy species, which simply means that they live life in the fast lane. 
Um, they're good at breeding and producing larvae, and they grow very quickly. But to stretch the analogy, they also die like flies, and they are susceptible to cyclones because they're typically branching and quite fragile. They're the favorite food of the crown of thorn starfish, which is a predator of corals in this part of the world. And they are particularly prone to heat stress. So ironically, in the short term, the species that are recovering the fastest on the Great Barrier are also the ones that are the most susceptible to the next bleaching event. It's a little bit analogous to what happens on land uh, following a fire. The flammable grasses are often the first to, to bounce back compared to the longer-lived trees. So we're seeing very rapid shifts in the mix of species and the proportions of species on the Great Barrier for two reasons. One is bleaching is actually very selective. Some species are much more vulnerable than others. They will all bleach to some extent, but the hardier heat-tolerant species maybe only 20% of their population will bleach in a particular bleaching event, whereas it's closer to 100% for the more heat susceptible ones. So there's a filter during a bleaching event, and there's another filter in the period of recovery afterwards. So the mix of species on the Great Bear Reef today is quite different already from even 10 years ago. And so the Barrier Reef is transitioning very quickly from the reefs we used to have before mass bleaching was a frequent recurring event to the reefs of the future. And really, the question mark over where that trajectory will end depends critically on what global temperature stabilizes at. So we're about to go through the 1.5 degree centigrade global average target of the Paris Agreement. If we can hold it to two, and there's some doubt over that, um, then I think we'll still have coral reefs, but the mix of species will continue to change. That trajectory is already underway. That train has left the station. Um, If we go much higher than two, then um, eventually we'll reach a point where reefs like the Great Bear Reef won't be recognizable anymore as as the same ecosystem of a couple of decades ago, there'll still be tropical ecosystems. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. There'll be something growing on the east coast of Australia. You know, it will have fish, but they'll be different from the fish of today, a different mix of species. There might be more sponges, more seaweed, because they tend to be more heat tolerant than corals. There'll certainly be fewer corals. And it will probably only be the hardiest ones or the ones that can bounce back really, really quickly. Yeah. And and as I said, that's a huge trajectory that's happening globally on the world's coral reefs. And really, we do have some capacity to steer that trajectory. It's up to us to determine what the end point, what we really need to see happening as quickly as possible is for temperatures to equilibrate for them to stop rising and ideally equilibrate at as low a level of warming as we can achieve through rapid transitions in reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. And you, you just linked it to the to the broader climate change discussion. With the climate broader goals, we're not seeing the, the political structural changes that are going to achieve the goals right at this second. Many people don't realize that the sea level rise in the longer term, and I'm talking now thousands of years, that's already set in motion by the current level of warming is, is is measured in meters or tens of meters. So if we get to two, two and a half degrees of global average warming, that translates eventually into about 20 meters of sea level rise. You can think of every coastal city in the world will eventually drown because of the levels of warming that that we're already at and entering into in the next um, couple of decades. So certainly we've made some radical changes to the planet. We often talk about coral reefs running the gauntlet of climate change, meaning things will get worse before they get better. So we're at a stage now where climate change has pushed coral reefs out of their comfort zone. We're seeing significant losses of corals, mortality of corals, 
during these recurrent bleaching events. We've actually seen on the Great Barrier Reef that when we get two consecutive bleaching events in quick succession, that the impact of the second one is less severe than the first. Now, that's not a good news story because we still have the cumulative impact of a severe earlier event and a less severe later event. But we are already seeing evidence around the world of responses by the corals where they have already begun the process of toughening up to these recurrent bleaching events. Sadly, a lot of that toughening is caused by the observation that dead corals don't bleach twice. So the change in the mix of species is a big part of that story. But there's also the beginnings of an evolutionary response by corals. We're not measuring that very well. It's very difficult to tackle at the scale of something like the Great Barrier Reef shifts in the genetic composition of individual coral species. But certainly coral reefs are going through these enormous natural selection events, which are incredibly select. We've documented shifts in the mix of species, and there are certainly shifts in the genetic composition of individual species as well. Heat tolerant genotypes are rapidly being selected for because the susceptible ones are being killed. Now, many people in my field of marine biology are turning towards coral restoration projects as a means of you know, rescuing coral reefs. The problem with various types of coral restoration is, firstly, they're very expensive. They are um, incredibly labor-intensive. And so the average size of a coral restoration so far, and we've been doing this now for several decades, is only a few tens of square meters. The total area of coral reef globally restored in the last 50 years is probably about the area of maybe five football fields. And to put that area in context, the area of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is 70 million football fields. While populations of corals on the Great Barrier Reef, even after six bleaching events, still number in the tens of billions. And those wild populations are certainly responding. They're certainly beginning the process of evolving. So I think we should be focusing on reducing the drivers of change, reducing pollution, reducing overfishing, and particularly reducing greenhouse gas emissions to give wild populations the best chance to reassort themselves in coming decades as best they can. Yeah, everything you just said is like a warning stroke call to action, especially on the emissions front, I think. And can you give give a little snapshot of the Australian government's position on fossil fuel emissions at the moment? Yes, yeah, so in Australia, the stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef is, is obviously very topical and quite controversial. And there's an ongoing dialogue between the Australian governments at the state and Commonwealth level, that's our federal government in Canberra, and with UNESCO. So there's three levels of governance, if you like, the international UNESCO level, the Commonwealth of Australia level, and the state of Queensland level, they're all involved in um, stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef. UNESCO has threatened, if you like, to place the Great Barrier Reef on the World Heritage in Danger list several times over the last um, 15 years or so. So far, Australia has managed to lobby and convince members of the World Heritage Committee not to do that. Most recently this week, when the World Heritage Committee met in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. But UNESCO has promised to revisit this issue at their next meeting. So Australia is required to report back to UNESCO on further progress for better protecting the Great Barrier by next February. So Australia is pouring money into the Great Barrier Reef. They're investing a lot in reducing water pollution. That's runoff of sediment and nutrients from land, which is one issue. They're investigating about $100 million in the last five years in coral restoration projects. And that research is ongoing, but I think you'd have to say so far it's still in the promising basket. The elephant in the room in terms of Australia's governance of the Great Barrier Reef is Australia's ongoing love affair with fossil fuels. 
So the new Labour government in Australia is on the face of it more progressive in terms of now having slightly better greenhouse gas emission targets for 2030 and net zero by 2050. But at the same time, and this is completely incompatible with those targets, the new Labour government has recently issued permits for four new coal mines or extensions of existing coal mines, in some cases all the way out to 2073. And they are also heavily subsidising fossil fuels. Most of the fossil fuels produced in Australia are exported. Australia is the third or fourth biggest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. It's primarily um, coal and methane gas. And uh, some of that coal and fossil gas is exported every day on ships that cross the Great Barrier World Heritage Area. So many people, including myself, have criticised the Australian government for its ongoing inadequate response to threats to the Great Barrier Reef and other coral reefs around the world by its ongoing support and subsidies for fossil fuels. Yeah, and obviously Australia is not alone in increasing fossil fuel production around the world. I think it was two weeks ago, around 200 scientists signed a letter calling for accelerated and expanded ocean-based carbon dioxide removal research. Is that something that you support or have a view on? Well, it's a form of geoengineering. It's unclear how using the ocean to absorb CO2 by adding chemicals or but basically by tinkering with the physical oceanography of the planet. It's an incredibly risky thing to do. It provides license to fossil fuel companies to continue with business as usual. The simple mantra of leave it in the ground is the safest and most straightforward way of dealing with global warming. As a marine biologist, your view on tinkering with the ocean in this way is you haven't seen any opportunities where you think that would be a good idea. Yes, that's correct. So, you know, I'm a biologist by training. And so the the key thing to me is to maintain healthy ecosystems. They won't be the same ecosystems in the near future than the ones that we've been studying historically. So, you know, I tell my students that there's never been a greater need for knowledge about coral reefs and how they work, because everything we thought we knew about how they work is wrong. Uh, They're changing so rapidly. Uh, The mix of species, some places like the Great Barrier Reef has changed radically in the last few years. The way that the Barrier Reef is interconnected through transport of larvae, The wiring of the reef, if you like, has completely changed because of differences in the response of different types of corals that breed differently. So it's a new system that we have to relearn in order to be knowledgeable about where that system is going and what we can potentially do to keep it healthy. You're on the other side of the world to me. (laughs) Do you see... um... Any significant social response to all these things we've been talking about? Yes, I do. Um, So I think public knowledge globally of the vulnerability of coral reefs is at an all-time high. If you look at a, a school protest in Sweden or whatever, you'll see a poster of a bleached coral or an emo recognizing this sort of iconic status of coral reefs. And as we discussed earlier, it's not just coral reefs. Um, many, many other ecosystems are at least equally vulnerable to coral reefs. I think it's the case in many countries that governments are out of step with public opinion. Certainly here in Australia, many people voted to change the government at the last election with the expectation that there would be a marked change in energy policies, emission policies, policies for um, stewardship of nature. Unfortunately, um, many of those voters have been disappointed by the new government. The policies are marginally better than the last government, but the support for fossil fuels still remains very strong in Australia with both major parties. Yeah, I I think politicians are aware uh, of increasing public support for things like renewable energy. So when our Minister for Environment announces that she won't be issuing a permit for a coal mine, 
there's a big press release and a lot of publicity. But when uh, other coal mines, many more of them, uh, do get a permit, um, it's done at you know quarter to five on Friday afternoon when there will be no media uptake of that story. Yeah, it seems like a familiar narrative. Look, it's been absolutely fascinating to speak to you. Thank you very much for discussing all these um, complex issues. Thanks, Nick. See ya. Thank you for listening. A reminder that episodes appear weeks earlier for YouTube and Patreon members. This is due to my work schedule. However, support for the podcast enables this work to continue. Thank you.